But controlled people. Yielded to the Spirit of God. Where we establish spiritual friends and biblical convictions. Because at times we try to fight sin alone. We try to fight it without God. And we try to fight it without godly friends. And that's why James kind of writes in James 5.16. He says, therefore confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And there have been many times in my life where I was so glad to be able to talk to Gwen about something I was struggling in. Or one of the people that I, I was in accountable relationships to. Because, see, accountable relate people say, well, I have accountability, but they don't talk about the issues of their life. And sometimes it's a smokescreen. <clears throat> and I've been so glad that I've had friends who have prayed with me and prayed through things. I, I had a friend who was struggling on the road. And we just had this thing. I said, well, if I'm struggling in this way, or you're struggling in this way, you just call me, right? He sometimes call me at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm struggling. You need to pray with me or sing to me, Robin, and put me asleep. So we prayed. And we talked through stuff. And we love God's presence to be in the midst of this to remove it so we did not sin. And then there's also, and this is a key verse, if you go to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, many of you have it memorized, but it's more than just memorizing it. It's taking the way out of it. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. See, there are people I've had in my office who say, Robin, I, I think I'm the only one who has this temptation. I said, here, I'll give you a few names of others who have this temptation as well. And this is that God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, tested, tried. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure. I always love the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. Talk about a guy who was tempted over and over and over again. To choose the quick way, right? To choose the short-term thing. But God had a bigger goal in his life, and he waited, he waited on God, he, he ran, he avoided, he did whatever he could to just honor Jesus. And in Ephesians 5, it says, there is the key, be filled and yield to the Holy Spirit daily. Just like Jesus was filled and led by the Spirit through His life, we will be led by the Spirit into times where we will be bombarded with lots of things. But we can be careful how we live, it says. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because of days that are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. At the moment of temptation, you need to ask the question, you need to get neutral before God and let this other stuff pass and to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I've had people say to me, well, the Lord told me to commit adultery. I go, what? You're a liar. Sometimes I get up and leave. Sometimes I just have to wake up to the fact that they've been controlled by a demonic spirit or sin to the place where they have been so deceived that they start believing lies about sin. And it says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Or you can insert a lot of different things there, which leads to debauchery or a wasted life. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another psalms, hymns and psalms from the Spirit. There are times where I get tempted or start having a bad attitude. I just start singing praises to God. It's kind of like, I hear you, Satan. I hear you, demonic forces, but praise God from whom all blessings flow. Just let it go. And so many of us maybe have not had the biblical convictions or understand those convictions where we can just say this. And there have been times in my life 
especially as a young man, unmarried, where there was temptation, and I had someone say to me, hey, why don't we get together this weekend? I go, I can't. And they go, why not? I said, because you're not my wife. And we're not married. Well, we don't need to be doing that, Robert. Come on. I go, oh, sorry. And my mother doesn't approve of you either. <laughs> that was always a good one. <laughs> but it did a lot of harder. Because notice this, through faith in Jesus Christ, the Word of God, and the Spirit of God, you are given the power of God to overcome sin and temptation. And just can you continue to grow? There are things in my life where I struggle, and it's getting less, because I'm just walking with God. I'm walking close to Him. See, and, and there's three words I want you to write in your, your notes today. Just to finish up. First word is compassion. When people come into our church from their different backgrounds and whatever they've been into, my hope is that our church is a place of compassion and love for people who are broken by sin and life and death. Because Jesus welcomes them back. The, the second word is community. Because for us to really understand this issue, we need a community of believers that goes, hey, I, and we're transparent enough to say, you know what, I've struggled with that too. I don't know how many times the struggles I've had in my past or even my present, someone comes in the office or a pastor, he wouldn't believe what I struggled with. And I get to say, you know what, I struggle with the same thing. You do, Pastor? I thought you were perfect. I say here, call the when. <laughs> but Jesus wants to help us. We can help one another. We can pray for one another. We can be honest with one another. We struggle with these things. We need community to do that. That's why God has the church. This should be a hospital. It's not this place of perfection. Right? Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. Right? That's what he came for. And without Christ, we're lost. With Christ, we're found. And the other C word is Christ. Because without Christ, we don't have compassion. Without Christ, we don't have community. Without Christ, we cannot be forgiven. We will just stay in our sin. And we will go into a Christless, godless eternity. If our sins are forgiven by Jesus. And this last song that the team's going to sing has been our song of the month. It's been a very powerful song. It's about coming to Christ. And maybe you're here this morning and you've been struggling with sin, you've been struggling with stuff, you've been struggling with life, and the consequences of the choices you've made, you feel like you, there's no way that you can come back from it. Well, guess what? You can't come back from it. Only Jesus Christ can help you come back. And it's through Him. And if you're here this morning, you don't know Christ, I hope the words of this song, and as I close after this song, that the Spirit of God is speaking to you. Or maybe you're a Christian, and you've been playing kind of one foot in the world, and one foot in the church, and you're just kind of doing this back and forth. You've got this sin, confess thing going, thing going on, and it's just wrecking you. And you need to come back to Jesus, allow Him to be the Lord of your life. He's not the appendage of your life. He's not just an add-on in life. He must be the center of your life. Him and Him alone. Must be Lord. A few years ago, after a service that I preached in Ottawa on this particular subject, a young woman in her mid-30s came up to me and she said, 
Pastor, you're all wrong. We don't struggle with sin. I have reached perfection. I said, well, how do you reach perfection? And she said, well, I keep all the laws of the Lord. I said, well, that's interesting. I said, well, what about Christ? Well, yeah, yeah, he paid for my sin on the cross and everything, but I have sinless perfection now. To which I said, can I talk to your husband? <laughs> and can I talk to your children about that? Well, you don't need to talk to them about it. She just kind of blew up at me. And I just said, well, you know what? You just sinned against me and against God because you have uncontrolled anger. <laughs> she had visited the church for the second time that particular Sunday. I did not see her again. I was having a conversation with Ray up top this morning. And he said, Pastor, what do you think of this question? Do you think as believers that we can have sinless perfection now? I said, Ray, you've heard enough from me. You know I, can't, I haven't reached it. Right? And neither has he, as we admitted. And uh, so here's the question this morning. How many of you have been tempted this week? Okay, okay. Some of you have been tempted to lie just now, too. <laughs> The temptation is different than sin, right? Temptation is a trial, right? Or a lure to sin. Okay? So let me ask you the next question. Because I'll put my hand up first. Okay? How many of you have sinned this week? It might not be something gross. You didn't go rob a bank commit adultery, or anything like that. But maybe, how many of you just had a bad attitude sometimes? <laughs> yeah. You, you had a bad attitude toward maybe yourself. Maybe not yourself, but somebody else that you're sitting beside even this morning. too. Just thinking and dwelling upon it is sin. And Jesus confirms that over and over. So, if we all have this problem of sin and temptation, and that no one in this room, or anyone we walk by this afternoon, or talk to this evening, is Perfected. We all have the same problem. We all have the same need. Right? And, and we all struggle. Okay? I mean, I remember Rabbi Zachariah telling the story where he was interviewed by the media, and the media person was saying, Look at all the bad things that are happening around the world. And, he's, and the media guy turns to Rabbi and says, What do you think? Is the problem. And Ravi just goes, it's sin. And the interview was over. Because that's what we have in this world. There is no psychological methodology, no medical pill, no self effort that can <coughs> overcome sin. This is a spiritual problem. It's a soul problem. And you can't solve a soul problem or a spiritual problem by a pill or by some psychological methodology. I think it was D.L. Moody. He was a very simple pastor back in the 1800s in Chicago and he was interviewed as well and he was talking about sin and he said you know what a guy can get and he was talking about the railroad for some reason remember railroads we, we still have them, right? but it was kind of the main deal right back then transportation and he said 
Yeah, like the criminal who goes and pulls up spikes to get money for the metal. He said, you can put him in jail for 20 years and re-educate him. But the more education he will have, he will come out of jail and be, be very educated to the place where he not only takes the spikes, he takes the rails too. And I think he makes a great point. See, we've fallen into the trap that, and I believe in good education, so don't get me wrong. But we can't re-educate sin out of people. We need somebody else to invade our life. The Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a world with great problems because of great sin. But there is hope through Christ. Why was he tempted like we were and did not sin? See, people grow in Christ as they overcome sin and temptation, notice this, by his power, not our power. He is our example to follow. And I want to remind you of a couple of things this morning as we go through this message and then give you some very just clear applications as we walk through this. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. I hope you have a set of notes this morning as well. We're going to move quickly through this. And uh, this is the temptation of Jesus. And this is just right after his baptism and the clear message from John the Baptist that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it says here, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, key indicator of who Jesus is, returned from the Jordan and was, notice this, led by the Spirit into the desert. Led by the Spirit. Not a demon, not the devil himself, led by God into the desert. Where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil, he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. And so here's what happened. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil leads him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I'll give you, author you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be all yours. Then Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Then notice this verse. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. I think there are times in our own lives where we, as we come to Christ, we kind of get into this false belief that I will not be tempted again or in this particular way. And all of us in this room have certain bents towards certain sins. Okay? You might not have a temptation about eating too many donuts, but some other people do. Uh, there was one uh, Christian counselor, I read a quote from this week, that in the last five years, the, the young, young adults that he has been ministering to, that about 80% of them come in to talk to him about two specific areas of sin or struggle. One is pornography, and the other one is suicide. And he said that the two are really tied together. Because when people fall into the area of pornography and, and watching all that stuff, uh, pretty soon they get to a point where they are not satisfied after a while, and because of their sin and what's been going on in their heart and mind that takes them away from the things of God, the only outcome without Christ invading their life is really suicide. And he's seen it over and over again. 
And we're tempted in different ways. For some of us, it's things. For other of us, it's money. For others of us, it, 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 it might be some addiction of some kind where we, we had an opportunity, maybe when we were younger, to say no to a certain thing, but we continue to say yes to it and actually has controlled our life. And the only way that we can be set free from it is if Jesus Christ is truly Lord of our life. And we have the accountability to deal with it as well. So Jesus is tempted and he's tested. Remember that being tested is not sin. And a trial, that's another way to say that Jesus, there was trials that Jesus went through in those 40 days. See, God uses the, the temptations and the trials so that you and I will depend more and more upon Him and not ourselves. Okay, you've got to understand that. And we will all have trials. We will all get tempted, right? But, but Satan himself and the demonic world wants to, you to tempt us, to test us, to try us, to destroy us. Because sin is a destroyer, as we will see. I think in our society, you know, I've heard people say, well, I just told a white lie. What's a white lie? It's a lie! Right? Well, I just sinned a little bit. We, we kind of sinned a little bit. Right? Yeah. That's like eating a hundred cookies and taking a bite out of each one. I only ate a bit. But notice something. Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit and he's led by the Spirit. How does Jesus... Yes, he's God come in the flesh. But he is tempted just like we are, yet was without sin, the Bible says to us. Temptation number one, if you are the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. I mean, this is a temptation that all of us kind of get into sometimes. Well, Jesus, just do this for me, and then I, you know what, I'll follow you. We want the miraculous. We want the, we, we, we want the exciting things to happen. And the response Jesus gives is right out of the Word of God, Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. Notice what he says here. Right? Man shall not live on bread alone, but, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the response is the Word of God. When we're filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit, we use the Word of God, to, and as we know the Word of God, we, we combat this, these trials and this temptation by answering them with the Word of God. Temptation number two, I will give you all the kingdoms if you worship me. Right? Satan has, does not have the authority to give him the kingdoms. Do you understand that? It's a, just an out and out lie. Now we can give ground to Satan. And know that governments have done that. And governments are giving more to Satan. Giving territory to him. But, but Jesus is, is, has all authority over all the kingdoms of this world. And you know why? Because he takes people out. And puts people in. That's what the word of God said. And the response of Jesus. Because Satan wants people to worship him. He wants people to worship the, the demonic forces or those isms and other things and false religion and all of those things. Because false religion or religion is just man trying to get to God on his own turn. But we have a relationship. I don't know how many people have said to me, they've said, you know, Robin, I'm not, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And I say to them, I'm not religious either. But I am spiritual because of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And He's the only one who can make me spiritual. So that either opens up more questions, or they go, I don't want to talk to this guy anymore. And usually I just ask them, so why do you believe this? I just keep asking them questions. Pretty soon they tie themselves up and they realize they're out of gas. They have no answers. Because what, what's happening, just like in our society, 
People have become so self-centered because it's all about self-esteem, self-centeredness, this and that. Even on the radio the other day, sometimes I just listen to CBC to, to kind of understand the world a little bit more. And the world is still the same. It's the same back with Jesus' time as well. People are trying, well, you know what, I, I, I'm just really fine with myself. <laughs> I'm living this lifestyle because I'm just trying to find myself. You cannot find yourself by yourself. The problem is self. We can only find our true self, our true identity in Jesus Christ. The further the society gets away from the things of God, the further we get into the confusion of identities. You have to understand. Right? So we got people self-identifying as dogs, cats in our world today. Right? Okay? Crazy stuff going on. Because as soon as you self-identify, you, you, you deny the identity that we have in Jesus Christ. That he made us male and female. That he made us who we are. The uniqueness of all of that. And as soon as you kind of walk away from the authority of Jesus Christ in your life, you can self-identify. There was one guy in England that was petitioning to see if he could get a marriage license between him and his computer. But our true identity is in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he says, the Bible says to us in a number of places in the Old Testament that we are his most treasured possession. I don't know what that does for you. But, but Jesus showed us that by going to the cross for all of our sin. That we are his most treasured possession. He didn't come and die for cats. Sorry cat people. He didn't come and die for dogs. Sorry, dog people. He didn't, he didn't come and die for the trees. He came and died for you and me. Plain to, So that we could have our sins forgiven. All of our sin covered over. Right? All of it. Past, present, and future. Yes, we will sin. But you know what the mark of a believer is? They are growing in Jesus Christ so that it becomes much easier to understand the, the devil's ploy in our life and the devil's lure in our life so we can say no and say yes to Christ. Sometimes we, you know, we look at these temptations and Jesus, you know, is, the next one is throw yourself down and God will protect you. It's kind of a recklessness, right? Well, you know, I, I can do whatever I want. Because God will eventually, you know, we'll work it out for me. That, that's the belief, basically, that we test God and basically say that it doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't matter what sin, we just won't have the consequences. I love in their book how people grow, Townsend and Cloud write this. There's kind of five quick things. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have it in your notes. But it just says... The first one is, we have a problem, and the problem is sin. Just straight up. That's what the Bible says. Secondly, we're responsible and accountable for our sin. The Bible says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. It says, for the wages of sin is death. Right? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're responsible and accountable for it. We will stand before God someday. But if we know Christ covers over all of our sin. Thirdly, we cannot do anything about it in a fully significant or sufficient way. You can try all you want. Try, 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 try. Keep, keep the rules. Keep this. Keep that. Keep that. You know, and, and, and I always have fun with my grandchildren and my son because when I give them a rule, they, they're automatically going to break it. And we're the same. Because the rules show us our sinfulness. That's their purpose. God's commands show us. Show us we, we broke. Well, you know what? I didn't break that one, but did you break the game? So we're in the same boat. They, they say trying to do better does not work. So we need help because the sin is hurting us or someone else. 
They go, they go on to say that these strong messages and legalism, kind of keeping the rules, just like that young woman that I talked to years ago. Or, or we kind of say, you know what, you should just make better choices. That's kind of the psychological rule. Just make better choices. And the same people keep making the bad choices. They're trying to make the good choices. Or as Pastor Jason and I were having this conversation this week, he said, yeah, that's the, just stop it! But sometimes we're so used to sin and sinning that particular way. The only way we can do it is through the, the, the only way is through the intervention of Jesus Christ. Because just stopping doesn't work. Because we all make simple choices. And then they say this, fifthly. Help us come in the form of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ replaces our sin, our unrighteousness, with his unrighteousness. In a sense, what they're saying is that he covers over us through his shed blood with his robe of righteousness so that we can live the exchange life or the spirit-filled life in Jesus Christ. So you can't overcome sin on your own. Only Jesus Christ can do this for you by His perfect sacrifice on the cross. We are not only responsible for our sin, but we are also powerless to keep from sin. Do you understand that? It's only through the power of Christ. So what is sin? This is not in your notes either. But 1 John 2.16 just kind of gives the brief, the brief definition. For everything in the world, notice this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So sin, can, every sin can be broken down into one of these three categories. Right? The lust of the flesh. Right? Maybe you struggle with some area of the flesh. Or it's the lust of the eyes. You're, you're looking around with what everybody else has, and so you're just kind of coveting what they have. And, and, and you see this stuff. And you're not content with what you have or what God has given to you. And you keep looking at others and what they have, and as a result, you're coveting what they have. And not being thankful or content with what God has given you. And the lust of the flesh is a big one for a lot of people. That's why we have just case after case of adultery. That's why we have. This lust of the flesh where people are sucked in to drugs and alcohol and so many other things that start controlling their life rather than giving their pain, giving their sin to Jesus Christ. Because he sets captives free. Do you believe that? I believe it. I have seen it happen over and over and over again. Because the best program in the world can't help people overcome unless they surrender to Jesus Christ. Because he's the only one who can forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and set us free from it. That might not, that doesn't mean perfection, as I said before, but, but there's a break of what happens, and we start being honest about our sin and the consequences that can just so easily get in the way of so much of God's blessing. And then there's just the pride of life. I, I saw this more, I think I've seen this more in the academic world than I have in any other place. But people believe because they have this, these recognitions, those pieces of paper, or whatever, that somehow they are above God. But as a result, I've, just, I've had many, just as many well-educated people in my office confessing sin to me and their, the lives that they are leading as people who maybe have a grade 10 education. Because it's not a problem. We all have the same problem. Sometimes we fall into the trap in our lives where we think, yeah, I'm and, and the pride of life usually says something like this. My sin is not as bad as so-and-so. 
And even in marriages, I've seen this too. Where I've counseled with people, and one of them will say, you know what? My sin isn't as bad as my spouse. Well, they've given themselves away. I said, you got sin too. Whether it's literal or big, it's not about the level. Okay? It, both are in trouble. The amazing thing I get excited about is when both people get broken before Jesus Christ and they own their own thing before God. And then that's when healing and health and so many things start to, to just work in their life and bless them. So how do we overcome temptation? Well, look at Hebrews chapter 4. Verses 15 to 16. We'll go through these quickly. So how do we overcome temptation? The only way we can overcome sin is through Jesus Christ. I want that right up front with this. But all of us who know Jesus Christ will still have areas of temptation that kind of come our way, that test us, that try us. And as a result of that, we can even depend more on the Lord Jesus Christ and His power through the Spirit and, His, and the Word of God. Or we can choose to kind of uh, cut Jesus out of things and just do our own deal. Which gets us into lots of consequences and lots of problems. Temptation is not sin. It says there in Hebrews 4, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, notice that, tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Did you know that at the moment you face temptation, that's when you should just drop to your knees and ask God for His help? Because He wants to help you. So many times we kind of wait around for that. Well, Lord, I'll try to do this on my own. And, and that's when we get into trouble, right? A few weeks ago, my daughter Leah, who's over here, and my daughter Mary, who's downstairs, invited all these other girls to go fishing with them. And uh, it, it was kind of funny, you know. I got a picture of them. I should have th threw it up today on the, on the screen. Out there by the cars, loading up their stuff. Right? My girls really love fishing. They can set up a rod and reel quickly. They, they just know how to fish. They get the worms, the, the minnows, and the dynamite. No, not the dynamite, but that's extreme fishing up north. But, but they go, and these other girls go with them, and they're all fishing together. And what are they trying to do with the lure or the bait that's on the rod? What are they trying to do? They're trying to lure the fish. Now, I think Sharon caught two fish that day. Yes, she did. Right? And, but, but the lure was there to catch them. Right? Temptation is the lure to catch you. But we can, when the lure is coming our way, we can say, Lord Jesus, I realize this is a temptation. I'm going to depend on you today. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to make that phone call to my friend saying, I'm really tempted in this way today. I need you to pray for me. And, and, and so temptation is not sin. But temptation is the start of the sin process. If you go to uh, James chapter 1, you see that there, right? There, there's this progression, and James has got it. It's like, he's reading my mind. He's reading our minds on this stuff. And there he is, as he says this, he says, When tempted, no one sh should say, God has tempted me. Tempting me. No, God is not tempted. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Verse 13 of James 1. But notice this, but each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Temptation is that enticement. It wants to drag us away from the presence of God. Sin is basically, we're saying, God, you're not here, I'll do what I want. Then after desire has conceived, thinking about it. You're letting it go. You're thinking about it more. You're not thinking about God. You've, you've let the temptation just kind of permeate your whole mind and thought and it's just 
there. And as a result, it says here, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Sin does not lead to life. That's what James is saying. Sin always leads to death. It, it never leads to life. And, and all of us who kind of lived a while understand that. It doesn't lead to life. It leads to death and the consequences of death in our life. So what does Jesus say? He says, first of all, watch for temptation. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. This is a person that just wants to live for Christ and is praying and watching and is aware of the things. You remember when they had video stores? There's still a couple of them. But to be honest, I remember when saying, we should go see this movie and rent the, the video. And she said, would you go and get it? I said, no, I don't want to go in. And at first she said, well, are you just being a nice pastor, a holy pastor or something? Because that's what I was thinking in my mind. I don't want her to understand that. So I just said, I don't like going in there because the video covers are really bother me. And what I see really bothers me. There are times in our life where we have to put the boundaries up. Whether now it's with our computers because people can walk around and watch anything they want and they think that no one sees them, but God does. And it's doing something to their heart and their mind. It's wrecking the marriages. It's wrecking their life. There are consequences. I've known people who got fired from their workplace because they've been looking at the wrong stuff and their company, unbeknownst to them, has software that is tracing out what they are doing online. And it might be Facebook, or Twitter, or whatever, that's getting more time in our lives than Jesus is. And we're hooked into it. So what are the boundaries that we need to have? Watch out for temptation. Then we have to pray, watch out for it, but also pray to overcome it. In, in, in Matthew 6, 13, we're reminded of the disciples' prayer, right? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Watch and pray, Jesus says in Matthew 26, 41, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Right? How we have to be spiritual.